So it is a pleasure to have with us today Chen Wang, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Chen's research focuses on new avenues to protect and operate superconducting qubits on both the physical and logical level. Chen graduated from Peking University in 2006 with a BS in physics and Cornell University in 2012 with a PhD in physics. He worked at Yale as a postdoctoral associate before moving to UMass in 2016. Chen is a recipient of the DOE Early Career Award and Young Investigator Awards from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the Army Research Office. Uh, great to have you, Chen. Look forward to your talk, which is entitled uh, Dissipative Stabilization and Error Correction in a Bosonic Qubit. The lectern is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Irfan and uh, the AQT Colloquium for inviting me here. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to, to meet you guys uh, virtually. And uh, let me share my screen and hopefully you guys can see that okay, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, as Irfan said, I'm uh, currently I'm working at uh, the UMass Amherst. I've been there for about five and a half years now. And what you see on the screen is our uh, brand new physical sciences building, and with a uh, old school traditional uh, building that's a historical building right now it becomes attachment uh, to the PSB, and that's like our office space and. Uh, inside the PSB, the basement, I, I operate this uh, superconducting uh, circuit, superconducting qubit lab, and currently with two and to be soon to be three dilution refrigerators. And we primarily work on the, on the control side of uh, um, aspects of uh, uh, superconducting qubits. And we will also work on, on novel ways to, to design and to, uh, especially with the, what you're going to see, dissipative stabilization in uh, bosonic qubit. So uh, the motivation of our work, and um, actually I think my preparation might be slightly undershooting of the, this, the level of the audience because I heard this is a colloquium, uh, but just to motivate things a little bit, if you think about uh, uh, why our classical information technology is so robust, uh, there are certainly ideas of uh, duplication and error correction and uh, majority voting going in, but really on the fundamental physics level, it's critical to have a dissipation in the system, right? When you see things, for example, a magnetic hard drive, you have these magnetic domains record information. And they're super robust because if you have any environment noise hitting on these, uh, on these magnets, they're going to scramble a little bit, but there's always dissipation in the system that actually function as a stabilizing force in in these information storage units. So it's actually pretty rare that you actually have to do very active work to correct uh, errors in the system. So a natural question would be, um, is it possible to, to borrow some ideas from, from, from this and trying to use dissipation to stabilize uh, quantum information? So the first question, if you are uh, very new to this or you haven't thought about this at all, uh, then the first question you may ask is, can a quantum superposition even live under dissipation? Because oftentimes you hear uh, dissipation is bad, it destroys quantum coherence, right? I think there's this very trivial but still fascinating example to think about, which is a weakly damped harmonic oscillator uh, driven on resonance. Uh, you can think about the optical system or the electrical analogy or uh, electrical system, or just think about a mechanical oscillator. If you have a Hamiltonian that is a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian under a drive of this form, which is your regular classical coherent drive or single photon drive. And in the system, you also have dissipation, which is expressed by this dissipation operator, uh, which basically says stochastically, you're losing photons one by one in the, in the system. Then if you solve the master equation of this, uh, of course, you can do this completely classically. The result is the same. What you get is the so-called coherent state, right? This coherent state has a Poisson distribution of photon numbers. And this number, this complex amplitude alpha represents um, how big your coherent state is and what its phase is. And this coherent state, it's, very, it's in the classical correspondence limit, but it really is a quantum superposition state. It has well-defined superposition coefficients. 
in it. So this, this truly is a quantum state. And, but this is a quantum superposition, but it is, it is boring. We call that boring, right? And um, yeah, so, uh, okay. So the, the coherence state, as you know, it's uh, if it has, the oscillator has a frequency and uh, your, your, your phase space representation of this coherence state will rotate in phase space. And we typically pick a rotating frame so that this coherent state blob will be a, a stationary state in the, in the phase space. So if we take this step further and think about what are other steady states that can exist under um, dissipation. So can dissipation create more interesting states? Uh, generally speaking, the system will relax to a specific quantum state. If you this state satisfies uh, any dissipation operator acting on your state uh, will give you the state itself, and uh, any the effective Hamiltonian of this uh, of the system acting on the state will give you an eigen energy. Or more typically, you can think about uh, quantum think about steady state or dark state under a Hamiltonian and a dissipation condition that will be steady that will be be stationary if you satisfy these two conditions. Um, you have no emission. Um, no emission when you are subjected to this dissipation operator L and your Hamiltonian um, gives you status support this psi as a steady state. So if we want to do interesting things with dissipation, really it depends on whether you can create interesting this loss operator, jump operator L in the system. Um, different jump operator will give you dramatically different steady state of the system. And that's going to, to make very interesting things happen. So this term quantum reservoir engineering is about uh, um, introducing exotic, interesting environmental interaction as you can typically express by a loss operator L uh, interacting with your system. And so the subject of uh, our work and this talk is to in in engineer interesting loss operators. So. Uh, actually, some of the very early work was done in Irfan's lab. As you can see, when, when people start to engineer new interesting loss operators, you can start to stabilize non-trivial quantum states. This is uh, back in 2012 when you have loss operator of this form, then you can stabilize equator superposition state of, uh, of a qubit. And in an oscillator system, if you have a jump operator that's a superposition of uh, A and A dagger, you can stabilize squeeze state of oscillator. And if you have a linear superposition of, uh, of photon loss operator in two cavities, uh, plus some balancing Hamiltonian, you can uh, engineer the situation of directional photon transmission. And moreover, there are more, more uh, sophisticated level diagram where you can engineer specific dissipation processes where you can stabilize two qubit bell state. And there are many more other proposals out there um, in, the, in this regime of uh, quantum reservoir engineering. And the work um, we do that is closely related um, is engineering loss operators in, in uh, oscillators or um, superconducting cavities as we work with. So this is a, a work um, out of uh, Yale and later on in um, Paris. Um, where um, it has engineered a driven dissipative system where the Hamiltonian is composed of uh, this two photon drive. So you are adding or extracting photon pairs from the oscillator. This is of course also what you know as a single mode squeezing Hamiltonian. And the key is that it's also engineered a form of dissipation, which is extracting photon pairs from the system. So if you solve uh, master equation, or if you can simply think about this in terms of a quantum Monte Carlo picture, uh, you can easily see that there are two steady states you can think of uh, in the coherent state basis. There's plus alpha and minus alpha. They are both dark states of the system because you can easily check um, if you apply uh, if you apply a operator on the a square on this on either of these states, you get back to 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 itself. So. We have two dark states with the same energy in the situation. So there's not one, but two steady states in the system. And moreover, there are actually any superposition of these two steady states will also be a steady state of the system. So this has created a situation of uh, a confinement of your oscillator state, which lives in the high dimensional Hilbert, Hilbert space down to a two dimensional Hilbert space that you can encode quantum information. 
And moreover, with this kind of situation, um, these two states are uh, pretty far separated in phase space. So there is a level of protection in the system, which, uh, which renders this kind of a qubit called bias noise qubit, so that it can exponentially suppress phase flip in this picture, which represent, which you can think of as one coherent state suddenly swap into the other coherent state, which is exp exponentially suppressed in this driven dissipative system. Uh, but there is also one obvious problem here, which is uh, uh, the which is uh, it's not protected against a single photon loss in the system. And actually dominant physical error in the superconducting cavity would be single photon loss. So even though you stabilize this uh, qubit manifold, um, but single photon loss happens stochastically in, in the form of a photon parity jump, it's going to, it's going to destroy the, um, the, the superposition. So this can work as a building block, but you still need like repetition code on the next level to, to correct these, uh, these single photon loss. But still, even just a, a biased noise qubit, it turns out to be very useful. It's a, it's a major uh, improvement compared to qubits that you can have both T1 and T2 types of error. So in our lab, we like to push the toolbox of reservoir engineering into, um, into new space, into a new level. So one thing we think about is how about we rent reservoir engineering in the two cavity Hilbert space? So what kind of exotic uh, jump operators and uh, uh, what kind of steady states we can get. So just to remind you, um, this is again the trivial situation of single cavity with classical drive and the loss. You can think about the situation as you have the, your drive that uh, drives your state climbing up the ladder from vacuum to one, two, three, four photon states, and you have the balancing dissipation that push you down. And the steady state of this is a coherent state, as you know, and we can, we can actually rewrite, uh, combine this uh, drive Hamiltonian and the dissipation into a single dissipation term where the jump operator is actually A minus uh, alpha. And very analogously, um, actually, if you can produce um, a situation of a pair photon drive and dissipation, let's say if you have two cavities, two cavity modes, A and B, and you only add or subtract the photon pairs from both cavities simultaneously, you have a pair photon drive Hamiltonian and pair photon dissipation. Then in this situation, your dissipator can be lumped into a form of AB minus some, uh, minus some complex number. So in this situation, you have a dissipator of this form and it's going to, it's going to support a type of superposition of all these, uh, of all these uh, pair photon states with equal photon numbers. So this is the so-called pair coherent state. Um, in fact, this pair coherent state was first theoretically uh, studied um, by um, in this paper from back from 1971. And uh, there was a lot of interest in quantum optics talking about the state. And so far, uh, to our knowledge, it hasn't been explicitly realized in, 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 in any experiments yet. And even in superconducting qubits, we have universal control. But if in general, if you look at this pair coherent state, if you wanna use, uh, use your quantum control tool to produce such a state, it's actually very, very difficult to do. And let me introduce this state a little bit. You see on the left hand, it's a coherent state. It's a Poisson superposition of in Fox state basis and alpha is the complex amplitude. A pair coherent state also has a very much Poisson-like uh, superposition coefficient. And uh, on, the, on the denominator, you have uh, a symmetrized version of a photon number in cavity A and photon number in cavity B. Here, this delta is a good quantum number, which, is, uh, which represents the photon number difference here. And the gamma is the co complex amplitude, very much analogous to the coherent state. So this is constructed out of a Falk basis where the two cavities have a, a fixed difference in photon numbers. So it has a, a set of interesting properties. One is it's a eigenstate of the pair photon annihilation operator. And also it's a, it's a eigenstate of uh, this uh, photon number difference operator where this delta is just the photon number difference calculation as you can, as, as you usually see here. And 
Uh, the reason we are interested in this pair coherent state, or we're interested in realizing and studying it, is there is a very, um, a very fascinating class of uh, quantum error correction code behind it. Um, the, well, you can use pair coherent state of the same amplitude of alpha and the same delta to construct this code called pair cat code. Uh, so let's say you can use the same delta equals zero and out gamma to be a positive real number versus negative real number, you can make logical states like that. And this is a set of code that actually allows autonomously corrected uh, qubit um, with a low order nonlinearity. For, base, for both the amplitude phase drift, if you apply this kind of dissipation operator, and um, you can also autonomously correct a photon loss uh, according to a previous proposal. If you can engineer Hamiltonian that's proportional to this uh, photon number difference. So, yeah, so we, in, in, in our lab, we, we would like to take at least one step towards, the, towards this goal. And we wanna show this, uh, uh, this simplified two photon dissipation instead of the eventual four photon that is needed. Also, we, we we're working on this demonstration of a photon number difference measurement in this uh, two cavity system. That's our experimental device. And uh, this is a system composed of uh, two cylindrical uh, post cavities. These are two 3D um, cavity modes with relatively long lifetime of about 500 and 200 microsecond. And this is a transmog ancilla that is used to operate these two bosonic modes. And we have a linear resonator here, a readout resonator that's used if, both for the purpose of reading out the qubit state, and also this serves as our Markovian reservoir to, uh, to engineer our dissipator. So this Hamiltonian is your regular Hamiltonian of uh, uh, storage cavities and the dispersive interactions and the qubit Hamiltonian. And uh, this reservoir, of course, has a relatively fast decay time or a line width of one megahertz. And uh, the frequency placements are roughly, uh, roughly look, like, uh, look like this. So um, yeah, I think this wouldn't be necessary. You guys probably all know how to, how to make qubits and how the qubits are designed. But this is a tutorial paper in case you are beginning graduate students. Then this paper actually goes through the, the, full, the full stack and kind of uh, um, process of a building such an experiment. And uh, the core um, principle of, uh, of this experiment, how do we engineer this uh, pair photon drive and pair photon dissipation? It's based on this uh, four-way mixing capability of a, of a Josephson junction. So a Josephson junction has, a, uh, has a, your usual uh, quadratic potential or second order terms. It also have a bunch of fourth order terms, such as the qubit and harmonicity, uh, cavity self cur and dispersive interaction. These are all fourth order terms. But if you drive the junction really hard, then uh, there are other fourth order processes going on. For example, if you drive, if you pump the system off resonantly from any tones, but it satisfied this condition where your pump photon uh, is equal to omega A plus omega B minus omega R. You would activate this four-way mixing process where your pump tone is going to combine with a, a, with a photon in this uh, reservoir resonator and generate photon pairs. So in this system, uh, what, uh, in this system what we do is that we, go, we, we pump the system with a tone at this frequency. That's going to give, give you this four-way mixing Hamiltonian, which generate photon pairs and annihilate a photon in the reservoir and the complex conjugate of that. And we also apply a second tone, which is a direct displacement drive on the reservoir, um, on the reservoir resonator. So this will give you the situation that uh, uh, you, we, are, we have four-way mixing drives that connecting these levels, which converts, uh, which, uh, which converts uh, one reservoir photon into a pair of uh, storage photons. Um, and also we have this displacement drive on the, on the reservoir to displace between zero to one and zero to one and, and so on. So in this situation, um, because our drives are relatively slow and uh, the, life, the, the storage lifetime is very long, but the reservoir lifetime is very short, 
uh, you can do this uh, adiabatic elimination of these of these levels because as soon as they are populated, they are going to drop back to the original uh, to the to the ground state and. Uh, um, the dynamics of this reservoir is very fast. After adiabatic elimination, uh, we basically recover into this situation where you have we have pair photon drive hitting the storage cavities, and we have pair photon loss hitting the storage cavities. Uh, the system, the 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 dynamics of the pair of cavity would look like this, where we have a pair photon drive strength that's proportional to the product of these two tones. And the pair photon loss rate that's uh, proportional to this uh, g square over kappa factor here. Now that we have a, a way to produce pair photon drive and pair photon dissipation, uh, we can test it out experimentally. Uh, it of course started with a lot of characterization and with uh, uh, parametric sweeps and spectroscopy. But in the end, once you find good parameters, um, as as we show here. You can, we pump the system for some amount of time, let's say 15 microsecond, using both this reservoir tone and this uh, four-way mixing drive. And then we can use the ancilla, we can run this ancilla spectroscopy, run the spectroscopy of the ancilla, and then read out the ancilla to probe what is the cavity state uh, for actually this pair of cavities. So this is a spectroscopy measurement of, uh, of our transma. So zero here represents vacuum state in the two storage cavities. And uh, because we know the dispersive shift of the two cavities, they are two megahertz and four megahertz uh, and six megahertz for the two. So these peaks about eight and 15 and uh, 21, these corresponds uh, very unnamed, very clearly uh, these pair photon states, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. And this state was prepared from a vacuum state, so it generally satisfies this photon, preserves this or conserves the photon number difference in in the system. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to to interrupt. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll be happy to take questions in in, in the middle. And. Uh, yeah, we can also take a look at uh, the time domain of, uh, of this dynamic process. And uh, this is a measurement where we vary the pump, the pump duration. So we analyze the, uh, the, cavity, the cavity states for, for varying amount of pumping time. And we didn't actually need to measure this whole spectroscopy at any time. We can simply park at specific uh, detuning positions to actually probe the population of these individual photon number states. So this is a picture where we you saw that you see, you see that we, once we turn on the we turn on this pair of uh, of pump tones uh, the zero zero or vacuum population drops very quickly and the one one two two three three they grow and eventually they stabilize there's actually a lot of oscillations going on in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, stabilization process uh, this is actually because there's a, a there's a lot of uh, self curve and cross curve interaction um, for the for these for the pair of cavities and uh, we have a reasonable fit and we understand what the pump rates are uh, for the eventual stabilization relative to to other parameters in the system and this is actually this is a calibration of the dissipation rate if we prepare the state if we pump uh, for let's say 20 microsecond to prepare this uh, this what we believe to be the pair coherent state and uh, then if we remove this uh, reservoir drive and we only have uh, this uh, four-way mixing drive the four-way mixing drive by itself is going to produce two photon pair photon loss but not pair photon drive so that's going to be a situation where the photons only they, 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 they are not added, but only lost in pairs in, in the system. So this is a, this is a measurement where we can, uh, we can calibrate this pair photon dissipation rate uh, independent of uh, the pair photon drive. And from that, you can see we have a pair photon loss rate that is uh, about one, one and a half order of magnitude uh, greater than the single photon loss rate in the system, which is why we can uh, reach this, uh, this, this uh, uh, quasi steady state before uh, these uh, the problem of single photon loss kicks in into in, into the system, and um, importantly, this is not just uh, uh, stabilizing a single steady state. Actually, what steady state it reaches it depends on the system initial condition because it's a pair photon process, so uh, it does not change um, the photon number difference in the system. If you have a, if you use a, um, some 
um, dispersive gate on the cavity to prepare initial state that's one zero or zero one. And we pump on the system using the exact same condition. We'll be reaching this uh, delta equals plus one pair coherent state or delta equals minus one pair coherent state. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation where we stabilize not a manifold of uh, one state, a manifold of two states, actually because uh, in principle, pair coherent state ha can have infinite different deltas. So this is a, a stabilizing a, a fairly large uh, quantum manifold in the, in the two cavity system. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much in details of, of this technique, but we figured out a way to measure the Wigner tomography of this uh, pair coherent state. So these are the joint Wigner functions uh, as displaced along the real real axis, uh, along, the, uh, along the real real axis of, uh, of, the, of the two cavities. And uh, uh, we show that we have decent coherence uh, across, uh, across the, the 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 components in the system for this delta equals 1, 0 state. This is a, a ideal, this is a theory uh, Q-tip simulation based on our system parameters. And similarly, if we prepare a delta equals one uh, starting state, we're going to get a delta equals one pair coherent state as proved by these, uh, uh, by these Wigner fringes to show the, the coherence in the system. And we've also done a, a density matrix reconstruction um, when we took large amounts of the Wigner data together with the, the photon population measurements, we can, uh, we can actually measure the, um, we, we, we determine the density matrix uh, elements of, uh, of the, in the delta equals zero and the one minus one manifold and actually find the off diagonal elements, which is how we can actually uh, eventually extract the fidelity, which is still um, a work in progress actually. So this is uh, uh, one piece of a uh, project that I would like to tell you. And another one is uh, um, this work of uh, error correction of photon jump errors. Uh, maybe it's a good time to, to pause a little bit to just uh, to uh, see if you guys have any questions. Don't be shy if you have questions at this pausing point. Okay. Yeah. In that. Yep. I was gonna. I was gonna ask maybe sort of a, mm -hmm. just a sort of a high level question in terms of expanding these techniques. So it's really beautiful data. I was looking at the spectroscopy there. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to sort of extend this into arrays of cavities or other things, is there sort of you know things that sort of extend very easily or other techniques that can be used if you have multiple cavities, etc. Yeah, so this is actually relatively resource efficient method because uh, it's uh, for the stabilization, you really need only need two tones. And if we have an array of cavities, so obviously um, you will have you would need um, you would need separate tones for, for, for each of the cavities unless they have they are very precisely um, lined up in frequencies. Um, I think I expect that these cavities they would be. Um, relatively independent from each other. So uh, I think just like uh, operating a large array of qubits, each of the qubits probably would need, would, would need its, uh, its, its own drive. Yeah, so it's basically linear and cube number. Whereas for example, I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, this experiment of Shaim Shankar was quite a tour de force experiment of a lot of <laughs> et cetera, to move things in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Shankar experiment actually has more um, microwave sources that, you, that, that, that is needed. So yeah, this one, this one is a two-tone uh, two -tone stabilization. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, if you go, you scale this up, there will be resource savings from there, but also I don't expect uh, uh, interactions to, to, to screw this too strongly. Yeah. Okay, very good. So maybe we move on now to the last piece. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so um, we just uh, talked about uh, um, a, a, a method of stabilization within uh, these manifolds, in this particular case, uh, pair coherent state. Um, the, the, the two tones, um, the pair photon drive and drive and dissipation in this example uh, was stabilizing a pair coherent state in the delta equals zero space, subspace, a pair coherent state in delta equals one and one pair coherent state in delta equals minus one. Um, it actually supports stabilization of all these manifolds simultaneously, but what it could not correct or stabilize against is in the system single photon loss. 
if you have a single photon loss in cavity A, what happens is you're going to shift all these uh, super, this whole superposition state, which is the pair coherent state, let's say in the delta equals zero, shift one step left goes into the delta equals minus one manifold. Or, sim or similarly, if you lose a photon in B, you're going to shift it rightwards. So this is a, this is a situation that you, you want to think about whether you can do a correction of a, of a single photon loss process um, in, in the system, and even better, whether you can do it autonomously. And similarly, there's a situation for a single mode or one cavity uh, bosonic experiment where we talk about cat state, right? The, the, the very the example I showed you very early uh, about a pair about a, a two photon driven dissipation in a single cavity stabilizing a cat state manifold, right? It also doesn't resolve, uh, doesn't battle single photon loss. Uh, the cat state manifold, you can think about it as this um, even parity manifold and odd parity manifold. You can stabilize within each manifold. But when you have a photon loss hit, it's going to move you from even to odd or from, from odd to even. And if you ask the theorists, how do you stabilize uh, your parity in the single cavity or you stabilize photon number difference in two cavities? Uh, they're going to tell you, uh, you would need to engineer some Hamiltonian that is proportional. Find a qubit that's with the Hamiltonian proportional to parity or proportional to photon number difference. Um, if you know these guys, these are great theorists. They not only just to say this statement, but also they give you proposals of how to actually build these things. Um, but these things are generally pretty difficult to build. And we as experimentalists, we kind of like to cheat and to do whatever that's, that, that's the easiest or the most convenient, right? So this is a, actually a pretty surprise discovery that I'm going to tell you how to actually do a correction of a parity and using your regular machinery in, in the today's 3D circuit QED and actually do, do it uh, um, decently with, uh, with pumping very completely passively. So the code we look at here is the, is the four component CAT code. And uh, you see that this is a, this is a e odd parity superposition of, of CAT state. And it's an alpha and minus alpha superposition. And it's even, it's odd parity uh, because it's a minus sign there. And uh, on the Wigner function, it's uh, represented by a blue um, central point or origin. That tells you it's an odd cat. And red represents positive and uh, blue represents negative. So if we use a horizontal cat and a vertical cat, which is I alpha and minus I alpha superposition, uh, you, can, you, can, you, you use these as your X state. Then you can write out your Z states, your plus minus Z state or zero one logical states. They are one, five, nine superposition versus three, seven, 11 superposition. So this will be a situation where you've, we've encoded a logical qubit in this, uh, in this uh, odd parity um, subspace. Now, if you can correct photon loss errors, if you can find some dissipator that's going to map your error state back into the logical code space, then it's a realization of autonomous correction against the dominant error in the, in the system. So that's what we want to do here. And uh, this uh, error correction of photon loss was actually done initially, um, was, be, was, was able to be accomplished uh, using uh, FPGA feedback. So imagine you have an odd parity uh, code space, you encode your logical qubit, a photon loss happens, and uh, you're not going to lose any superposition coefficients. You're simply just going to, it's simply just going to map your odd states onto the corresponding even states. And even the cat size is not going to change. And if you are able to uh, perform QND tra tracking of a photon number parity, you will be able to figure out that an error has happened and uh, map it back or doing a, a different decoding to recover your, your quantum information. So this was uh, this parity tracking was implemented a few years ago, followed by this very tour de force experiment uh, at Yale, um, which did this uh, single photon loss uh, um, quantum error correction by QND parity measurement tracking. And this is a very um, it, this is this was a very hard experiment involving uh, in involving pretty deep level FPGA programming. 
And uh, in fact, this whole machinery build now is uh, was was the basis of the startup company Quantum Machine, where Nissan Mofac, this postdoc at Yale, now uh, started um, co-started that company, starting to sell this uh, this control electronics, which really was a. Uh, about three years of uh, nonstop work by him in 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 the Yale lab, uh, working working on this uh, the, the the infrastructure to build such an experiment. So active QEC of this type really is uh, quite uh, resource intensive uh, for, for for classical control resources. So this really is the the beauty of reservoir engineering, right? Can we build some dissipator that's just magically uh, doing this job? Uh, which says whenever the parity flips, let's just flip it back um, with the right phase, by the way. So this was the, uh, the subject of uh, this paper we published uh, uh, last year around this time. And uh, the, the, the way you can think about it really is you have a block sphere where uh, your qubit is within this uh, odd parity code space. If you have an error happening, you go to zero mod four versus two mod four. You want to produce a dissipator that's uh, that's like uh, isomorphic isomorphically mapping your 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 error qubit back to the to the to the logical uh, correct qubit. So the step really is uh, um, first of all we truncate these higher states because uh, uh, practically you you don't really you, you never really touch them that much in in, in practice, and uh, we want to think about this ladder just as I showed you. Um, in the in the in the spectroscopy of the qubit, you want to think about uh, your um, your your ancilla, which is coupled to the cavity, and that gives you the power of photon number uh, resolving resolving uh, control, right? So can we can you think about if you have uh, um, your cavity dropping from these even levels down to a, from this odd la odd levels to this even levels, and you engineer a dissipator. That just to push your state from zero to one, two to three, four to five, six to seven, and uh, you're going to just dream up a dissipator that looks like this. This is a what we call an even to odd parity mapping dissipation jump operator. That is just a zero to one, two to three, four to five, six to seven, right? And it turns out this is actually doable, and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know the theorists would propose you need a parity Hamiltonian, you need a parity pi multiplied by, by a sigma z. Uh, but even if you just have this Hamiltonian, this really is your regular dispersive Hamiltonian. You can do this uh, photon number selectively. So the way we do it is imagine you have an error happens that knocks your one state back to zero. So blues are um, the blue, blue levels are the code states, and red are the, the error states. And if, you, if an error happens, you're back to ground state. So here, the first letter, uh, the first number represents the photon number state in your, in your cat, in your code. And the second number, G, represents the ancilla transmog. Uh, we have a regular um, cavity system that looks like this, storage cavity, ancilla coupled to a, uh, coupled to a reservoir, as I just said. Uh, we only use one cavity, in fact, here, not two. And um, G represents transmog in ground state, and zero represents zero photon in the reservoir in the in the green mode. So first step, we put a CW tone connecting these two levels. So that's just a resonant excitation of the transmog to to E state. And uh, um, importantly, this tone, if it's CW, it's slow. It doesn't actually do this excitation. So it only excites the transmog if your storage cavity has zero photon because of dispersive shift. And then we, took, we, we use a second tone, which is the four-way mixing tone, as I said, uh, that connects these, the, the, these two levels. So it de-excites your transmog from E to G, and it adds a photon pair in the storage cavity and in the reservoir cavity. Now your reservoir, as I said, it's a fast decaying object. And now this reservoir is going to go back to, to ground state. So you've connected the path, connected the dot, and your error state got push the back of photon back into it and uh, get back to the code state. And now we can actually do this fourfold. Uh, imagine you have four microwave drives like this and four microwave drives like that. And uh, these, these drives are going to connect all the, are going to connect to the dot and push all the error states um, back, to the, back to the code state. And very importantly, you see these four tones 
uh, they are equally spaced by two times the dispersive shift, right? Because, uh, the, and so this way you avoid driving these blue levels because it's critical you don't drive these blue levels. That's going to destroy your code state and you don't want to push your code state to, to the error state, right? And uh, they have different frequencies, um, but these different frequencies, they have different slopes, as you see for these arrows, they are compensated by the frequency difference of these four arrows. So these four tones, they're going to, they're going to counter the frequency difference of these two, of these, these four tones. And in the end, you get uh, the same frequency of microwave emissions on the, on the very last step. And this is important, as you know, um, if you have a dissipation process that ends up emitting different colors of photons, if you were in different uh, number states, that will be an environment eavesdropping on your, on your code word, and that's going to deface your, your logical qubit. And by doing this compensation, actually, we end up uh, erase the switch path information. So uh, the quantum coherence of your logical qubit will be preserved in this process. And practically, you don't need A generators. You just need, uh, you just need uh, um, one LO source, and you just need a few different uh, modulation frequency on the on, on your, on your same LO source because these are equally spaced. And uh, if you have some comb generation uh, method, that, that would also be applicable in, in this situation. So now think about your reservoir to be short-lived. Uh, you basically end up with this dissipator in, the, um, in, in your system. Yeah, so how does this experiment look? Uh, first, we're going to just to prepare a, a vacuum state, right? We prepare a vacuum state uh, and we, we turn on our pumps and see, see what, does, what does it do. And um, the same story, we do transmount spectroscopy after pumping for some amount of time and see, see what happens. And this is your transmount spectroscopy. At t equals zero, which is, a, which is an x-axis, you see a, a transmount peak at uh, its uh, zero detuning frequency. And as time goes, which is the y-axis, you see this uh, transmount frequency jumps over to, this, to, the, to minus chi which shows that you've realized that this uh, a dissipative generation of a uh, one photon fog state. You see after 25 microseconds, we prepared a pretty clean fog state and it doesn't oscillate back because uh, it's, a, it's a dissipative process, right? And now if you prepare a cat state, let's say, let's go ahead and dial up a, a wrong cat, the even parity cat state, which is zero, two, four, six. You can slap this, uh, this, uh, this pump tone we call parity recovery by selective photon addition. That's our jump operator. We apply that for, for 25 microseconds. You see your, your transmount shows that your, your cavity is now in an in a, in a odd state. And we can also characterize this uh, dissipation operator and see what its rates are. And from zero to one, we can measure this time domain in time domain and see the one photon state grows over time. It converges to pretty close to, to 100%. If we prepare a two, sta two state, it converges to three. And if we prepare a four, it converges to five. And if we prepare six, it converges to seven. And uh, once you go up the ladder, six to seven conversion, uh, the, the efficiency drops because there is a single photon loss error that's happening in the system. Um, in fact, some of the six will drop to five before you can correct it. And uh, after you correct it to seven, it's going to continue to lose to six and you have to correct it back to, back to seven. So there's a dynamic balance going on. That's why um, the fidelity goes lower when you go to, go to the higher photon states. And from that, we can extract uh, these, uh, these pumping rates, lambda and the omega. And we try to balance lambda and omega for, for all four paths in, in our experiment. And this only shows you number conversion. Of course, we need to prove preservation of coherence. So this is sort of a process tomography procedure. Um, we would dial up these uh, pairwise superposition states with, uh, with our optimal control state preparation uh, pulses. And you can apply the suppress per operator over 25 microseconds and analyze the state with big tomography. And you see that you get uh, uh, the corresponding pairwise, uh, even, even, sorry, odd superposition states. And you analyze the, the off diagonal elements. Uh, you see that it's, it's, not, it's certainly far from perfect, about uh, two thirds of a, of a conversion. Um, yeah, but just, to, uh, but just to think about it this way, 
if you can if you can correct your quantum error like a two times out of three times, it's already a win, right? Assuming you don't you don't lose on on, on other fronts, which of course is is difficult. But um, we, we we're not look, really looking at you need to correct these like ninety nine percent of the time. If uh, if you can correct not two out of three, but more like a ninety percent of the time, that that will that will actually get you uh, quite 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 a, quite a bit above break even, um, as you'll see. So. Now um, we can try this out with some real world uh, logical qubit state preparation. So we prepare the six cardinal states in this, uh, in this four component cap, cap code. And if you just uh, hand the cats in dry and after some amount of time, you can look at these Wigner functions, you see you lost a lot of parity um, as the origin, the blueness of the origin, you can see you lost a lot. Also, the phase are scrambled because you lose photons at some random times. And if you keep your pump tones on on the system, after the same amount of time, you see your, your state is preserved much, much better. And also your parity in particular is uh, definitively odd, uh, as you see the blue origin in these, uh, in these Wigner plots. And furthermore, we can recover the state. Uh, once we, we have these states, they're, they, they're still just the Wigner functions, right? You can, you can decode the state back to a transmog and try to analyze uh, uh, the, the, the state fidelity of your, of your logical qubit that way. And we can compare some different timescales in the system. So this is the situation if you just put your information into your transmog. And over time, you see your transmog can hold your quantum information over about a 22 microsecond time scale, which is our um, somewhat subpar uh, performance of our, our transmog qubit. And if you just put it into your cat and you don't do um, this dissipative pumping, you end up a, a process fidelity decay time of 130 microsecond. Uh, so this is the uncorrected uh, uh, mod four cat, cat code. And if we, you turn on the pump, you keep the pump on, we see about uh, uh, 288 microseconds. So this is a clear demonstration that the pump tones are, are, are a big helper in, in preserving your, uh, your, your logical qubit. And uh, the sad fact, of course, uh, you always want to compare with uh, any way you can think of that's going to store information in the system. And in this case, if you, if you do some um, universal control and put your logical qubit in, in the FOC 0 plus 1 state, um, you would be able to get a slightly longer lifetime. And uh, this is fairly typical because whenever you do error correction, you have to duplicate your information and subject yourself to multiple times of the loss rate. Um, in the multi-qubit register, that means more error channels and more syndromes to measure. For a bosonic system, uh, you don't incur more types of error, but you do incur an elevated error rate because the cat has a lot more photons than, uh, than the FOC01 superposition. So, so hence you have a 3.4 3 times uh, overhead to pay. And our error correction gained back a factor of two, uh, but it's not enough to reach break even. Uh, but we don't think this is fundamental. It's certainly technically, technically hard, but if we have better thermalized ancilla in this experiment, we would be able to, um, to get to the break-even point. And if we can improve the cavity and the transmog further, we will be able to, to, to harness the gains in, uh, in this uh, uh, QEC process. And uh, uh, I think we should probably wrap up and I'll just briefly say in the future, um, we've demonstrated this uh, photon jump correction with uh, this uh, dissipation operator. And we can actually think about closing the loop and do a full dissipative error correction of not only this photon jump, but also other things, other problems in the system. Uh, one is the cat size spread. Uh, in fact, this press per correction will correct the parity, but the size of the cat will get will, will acquire some, some uncertainty in it. And also, uh, what if your cat um, has phase drift? And in this case, both of these can be corrected by this uh, four photon pumping process. I've shown you this uh, two photon pumping process. And if we can expand that to be to realize this four photon dissipation operator, then essentially that's going to close the loop and uh, correct both, uh, both bit flip and phase flip in, the, uh, in, in this kind of bosonic system. And yeah, 
So just to summarize, uh, I've shown you two experiments. One is the third generation and stabilization of pair coherent state manifold. And uh, another one is our autonomous correction of uh, a photon loss in a, in a single cavity cat. And these are a step from what you probably used to hear about quantum reservoir engineering as stabilizing a resource state. Here, we're really starting to stabilize not one state, but many states so that you can encode quantum information. And moving in the future, you can even think about using dissipation to implement or stabilize a quantum process. Uh, one thing we, we were thinking about was uh, uh, the idea of using dissipation to do robust quantum state transfer. So this is a this is uh, just a, a sort of a simple theory um, consideration and an experimental proposal on, on this front. And we're also looking at uh, possibly doing dissipative quantum gates or autonomously corrected quantum gates by, by, adding dis by combining really um, dissipative control and unitary control in the, um, in the bosonic systems. And uh, yeah, this, our lab works on bosonic qubits, and we also have interesting projects uh, in case you, you want to check out. One is on um, non-reciprocal circuit QED. We integrate uh, transmount qubits with a, uh, a non-reciprocal um, package system using, using an yttrium iron garnet under magnetic field to, to break time reversal symmetry. Um, this work is aiming at uh, to demonstrate non-reciprocal dispersive interaction at this point. And uh, we also have a project on doing uh, cross resonance gate with, uh, with fluxonium qubit and uh, really hoping to use the, the, the higher harmonicity and the long lifetime of fluxonium to, um, to, to, to push, push fidelity higher. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge my group and especially uh, Jeff is the main person leading on this dissipative uh, um, control experiments. And uh, Sean and Shudi, our junior graduate students, have contributed quite a lot. And uh, former postdoc Julian was the person who fabbed the device, um, really did a heroic job to get a decent transmount out of our relatively poorly conditioned uh, fab facility. And then we have uh, um, Northwestern collaborator Jens Koch and his graduate student Brian uh, helped us uh, with the um, OCT control of the um, bosonic system and uh, provided our valuable theory help. And we are open for postdocs and graduate students. So uh, please contact me if you are interested. Okay, hey, yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's thank Chen for a great talk uh, and open the floor up for questions. Um, I have a question. So, uh, thank you again for the talk, Chen. Uh, can you give a hint? Uh, how would you do logic gate? Um, and at the, at the same time, uh, you know, with this uh, scheme of reservoir engineering that you have on the cat uh, stage. Yeah, that's a that's a very um, that that's actually a pretty long term goal. And I wouldn't say we have a we have a we have a existing scheme or experiment on that. Um, but if you just think about this picture uh, on the on the left hand side here, this uh, uh, imagine if you want to do a uh, do an experiment to do a do a do a um, do a unitary operation on your logical qubit, which is the blue the blue levels, right? You realize this dissipator is actually completely completely acting on the red. If you are in blue, as long as you can stay away from red, um, the dissipator is not really going to affect your unitary operation. So this will be a this will be a, a way you can think about if you can you can drive and connect these levels, or certainly if you just want to push phase impart phases on these on these blue levels, that would be able you will be able to do it. Uh, um, in the presence of, uh, of of the pumping, right? So that's a that's a that I would say it's like a, a gate um, in that that's that's like a gate uh, that is coexisting with your with, with your autonomous correction. And now, if you want to think about uh, uh, if you have a photon loss error happening during the gate, then you can think about if you can do a mirrored operation in your error space along with your code space. 
because all the motion, all the dynamics of your correction process is mirrored for, for, for all four paths, right? So uh, if you can do, do your do your gate basically in a mirrored way on both the, the code space and the error space while your, your, your correction is working on the background. So there, there, there's this possibility that you can, uh, you, you can implement such an operation. Okay, thank you. So still a little bit more work to do on the gates, tricky, but really- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. The gates is, uh, is, pretty, is, is, is pretty, a, a pretty long way to yeah, go. Pretty still. Cool. So if I've understood, basically there's two things. The first thing that you said was you can have compatibility with your dissipator because it may not simply be acting mm -hmm. on where you can do your gate. And then the second more challenging thing is somehow to mirror uh, mm -hmm. and stabilize the whole thing. Yeah. Great. Uh, other questions for Chen? Uh, I have a question. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so if I look at the picture in the bottom left on this slide, I see that you know, I understand that you're doing this autonomous quantum error correction by, you know, this step-like process going from seven to six, for example, and then six to seven, and you're doing this with these uh, pumps. So mm -hmm. typically, I guess if I would have to guess, then, you know, doing this process faster with, you know, stronger pumps would make it a little bit better. Is that correct? And also, are you limited in your system by the strength of your pumps? And if, you know, would that, yeah, I guess would that make it better? That's my question. Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very good, very good question. Um, in, in in our system, actually, there are there 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 are several things going on. Um, in fact, we are not really limited by um, by by pump power. Um, in fact, um, if we pump harder, uh, you start to get into the situation that you're going to destabilize the the code state because. Uh, because these 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 pump these pump stages, the first stage of pumping is especially important, and unfortunately, we just need very very weak power. Uh, so you want to make sure you pump your pump acts on your even states, but not on the, on the odd state. If you if you pump too hard, um, it's it's very subtle. It's hard to prove it, but our math seems to indicate that uh, you you start to 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 destabilize your your code state um, a little bit with with that. And of course, you can optimize your parameters a little bit to 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 get away with that. Uh, but also, it's a two stage it's a two stage pumping process. In fact, um, if I if I go if I go back uh, to to show you these these curves, we are actually operating reasonably close in the in the critical uh, damping process. So, so the pumps, they, uh, we, you're, you're actually converting, this is your dissipation, the source of dissipation. So you're converting a population coherently, drive it from here to here and here to here, and then it decays out. So the hierarchy of rates in the system is this decay rate is way faster than omega and omega is much larger than, than, than lambda. So, so they, they chain together into a sort of a, 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 in, a in a critical damped oscillator. Um, situation uh, go, going through this uh, this pumping path. So if you pump this, uh, if you increase this these much harder, um, you're going to you're going to actually oscillate between these levels be between before the state de decays out. And um, yeah, of course you can increase kappa there again and allow you to, to pump pump slightly slightly faster. Uh, yeah, but there's there's certainly a lot of trade-off in this uh, in, in in this picture to to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and of course, pump pump harder. And I think uh, the the um, I think the the science of how to get your transmount to be the best uh, source of pumping is still is, is still ongoing. And we know if you you the four way mixer is uh, is nice, but if you if you if you pump it too hard, it's going to break, and you're going to get a lot of heating uh, problem in the in the experiment. Yeah, this this particular experiment um, of photon loss correction, in fact, is a uh, is a uh, pretty much geared near critical damping for this uh, for this lambda process. So. Uh, this gamma, this omega rate, we it's it's actually pretty far off from the the, the from the pumping strength that you're going to break the transma. Uh, but the other experiment, the the pair photon uh, pumping, the pair cap, the pair photon experiment, it's actually pretty close. So um, we do see quite a bit heating going on 
in order to pre prepare the, the pair coherent states uh, as large as you see. Um, yeah. Yeah, but there are ideas of uh, what maybe you can modify the trans mount and make it really more optimal for for use as a fully mixer and yeah, still a lot to be to be learning in, on that front. Uh, what's the what's the best way of pumping the system? Other questions for Chen? If not, let's thank Chen again for a great talk. We'll let you go on the East Coast. It's probably seven o'clock or so on your time. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for sharing all those beautiful results with us. And I wish everybody else a good afternoon and evening, depending on whichever coast you're on. <laughs>